Sunny Monday afternoon and a warm welcome to our Youth Research Dialogue. This episode is part of our uh, online series in which we discuss evidence-based youth research findings. My name is Carmen torbel kiviniemi I'm the project manager of the European Youth Research Network Ray, which is hosted by the Finnish National Agency for Education. Our network involves 35 partners, uh, including national agencies um, responsible for the European youth programs and national researchers. Today, Youth Research Dialogues is the last episode, or at least for now, within our Ray Monitoring editions. We started these special editions last October, and within our last five Youth Research Dialogues, we basically discussed and presented first insights and newest findings from our Ray Monitoring service. They are conducted with beneficiaries of Erasmus Plus Youth and the European Solidarity Corps programs. From young people's green competences to future needs, perspectives from the non-formal and formal learning fields. This is our title, uh, or this is the title of today's Youth Research Dialogue. We will approach this topic by reflecting on data from our RAIN monitoring service uh, on the program priority of environmental responsibility and fight against climate change. And these insights will provide us uh, with the perspectives of how the European youth programs actually address this subject. Furthermore, we will also hear interesting findings from the formal education side from our guest speaker who joins us today from the OECD. The areas we are aiming to discuss are individual knowledge and competences, um, for example, relevant factors for young people in acquiring environmental and sustainable competences in general. We also want to explore um, which dimensions of the green competence uh, is basically or are strengthened and fostered to the European youth programs. And we will also take a step a bit um, further and we will reflect on a broader structural issues, socio-economic aspects and related needs, as well as also as limitations of the European youth programs and yeah, food for thought and what is needed. A warm welcome to our guest speaker, Francesca Borgonovi. She is the head of the Skills and Analysis team at the OECD Center for Skills, so at the Organization for Econo Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, Francesca is responsible for the Skills Outlook publication. In the past, she was also part of the analytical and development work in the OECD-led in, uh, international assessments, for example, PISA, and she was also part of the Education for Inclusive Societies project. Francesca is also an honor honorary professor at the University College in London. From our Ray Transnational Research Team, we have Johannes Eck with us today. Also, a very warm welcome to you. He is a youth and a civic engagement researcher working for Youth Policy Lab, uh, which is a small research agency and think tank in the youth sector. He is part of the Ray Transnational team um, within the Ray Network and currently also working as a teacher in social work at the University of Applied Science in Cologne. Lena Surpe moderates our episode today and Tomoga Moric is our digital facilitator and that's basically everything from my side. I wish you an interesting dialogue and now to you, Lena. Hello everybody and welcome also from my side to this Youth Research Dialogue today. I am Lena Surpe and I will be your moderator today. Uh, and the topic uh, for today couldn't be more important and actual. And I will short, shortly uh, introduce the topic before we go to the presentations. Uh, children and young people are the majority population of the planet. Sustainability related issues and conditions affect every young person, daily life in Europe as everywhere in the world. Environmental challenges are interconnected interconnected to economic activities 
and societal conditions. The climate crisis is the theme that creates huge uncertainties for children and young people at every level of their daily life. Children and young people can be considered as particularly vulnerable, whether we look at the ecological, economic or social aspects of sustainability. This severe issue has been taken up also by the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, which emphasized children's and young people's right to live in a clean, healthy and sustainable environment in its, its general comment last year. Climate crisis as an intersectional issue with economic and social sustainability is not only a life condition for young people today, but can be considered also as a primary concern for the youth. Europe Barometer from 2021 stated the following. If the pandemic has driven young people's attention towards health, climate change remains, especially for young Europeans, one of the three main concerns that the European Union is facing. I myself working in the Finnish Red Cross and uh, if we take a look at the young people throughout the world uh, being uh, volunteers in the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, they have also stated uh, climate change as the most acute humanitarian challenge and crisis in the globe. So this is also the statement uh, from the young people over, all over the world. It goes without saying that the sustainability challenges also affect youth work in a cross-cutting way. Youth work can play a significant transformative role in highlighting the rights and aspirations of the young generation and promoting intergenerational justice locally, nationally and internationally. I can see that this potential also exists in the European youth programs, regardless if we look at the ecological, economic or social aspects of sustainability. This question of the role and future direction of the European youth programs and of course also educational field will be addressed in our dialogue today. Before we go into the presentation, I would like to remind the audience of the great possibility to join the dialogue. We invite you to ask questions either on the Facebook or YouTube chats or via Slido. Simply go to slido.com and type in the code which is now displayed on the screen. In an hour, we won't be able to cover the various aspects of this huge phenomenon, but we have a great opportunity to discuss the topic with the new research data and findings. We will start this dialogue with our first speaker, Francesca, who will present findings from the formal educational field and tell us more about the skills for a resilient green and digital transition. Please, Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, thank you for the introduction, Lena. I'm Francesca Borgonovi and I'm the head of uh, skills analysis uh, in the OCD Center for Skills. Uh, now, I will present some key findings uh, from our latest report uh, on skills for a resilient green and digital transition. In the next slide, um, I will present some of the findings we have on the environmental sustainability competence of young people uh, and the extent to which uh, they need to be strengthened. Next slide, please. Now, what do I mean in terms of uh, environmental sustainability competence? Uh, in the formal education sector, um, teachers uh, oftentimes think about what kind of uh, uh, skills young people need in order to be ready for the green transition and focus, for example, on science proficiency. And what you can see from this slide is that uh, uh, if you look at the light green bar, 78% of 15-year-old students uh, who took the PISA test, uh, the test for, uh, of the Programme for International Student Assessment delivered to 15-year-olds worldwide, um, on average across OECD countries, but uh, uh, across uh, the European Union, it's, uh, it's fairly similar, achieved at least the basic levels uh, of science proficiency. So the formal education sector is doing a not perfect job, but good enough job in terms of uh, equipping people with uh, uh, with science proficiency. But if you look at the dark uh, green bar, what you see is that only 33% uh, 
had both the um, science skills as well as uh, uh, the willingness to take action for environmental sustainability, saving energy or taking other pro-environmental actions uh, and reported caring about the environment. This means that oftentimes you have uh, young people who have the skill but not the will to act for the environment or indeed vice versa. Now, if we think about what is needed for the green transition in the future, um, next slide, please. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, one of the uh, things that I wanted also to stress uh, is that some of the inequalities uh, that we see in terms of uh, uh, basic uh, skills formation, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, skill acquisition in, uh, in the uh, education sector, are mirrored when we look at environmental sustainability. What you see here is the difference in percentage points between socioeconomically disadvantaged young people uh, in the dark um, uh, green bar and uh, socioeconomically advantaged young people in the light green bar uh, and the extent to which they have foundational levels uh, of uh, uh, environmental sustainability or more advanced levels. And what you do see is that in general, there is a big economic gradient uh, uh, in levels of environmental sustainability. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that, uh, that we see is that uh, education, but also uh, the training, uh, uh, vocational education and training, for example, need to be tailored in the future to ensure that we are able to achieve uh, ambitious climate objectives uh, and uh, uh, that we do not see labor market vulnerability, particularly among young people. Next slide, please. If we think about Europe, one of the flagship initiatives uh, is the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the Feed for 55 policy package uh, is one of the instruments uh, that the European Union has uh, in order to reduce uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, up to 2030. And what we do see is that the impact uh, of the policy package uh, will not be the same across different sectors. Uh, in particular, some of the sectors that are most responsible for large share of uh, CO2 emissions, uh, like uh, fossil fuel powered electricity, will decline uh, a lot, whereas uh, there will be a big expansion in terms of uh, employment opportunities uh, in renewable uh, energy production, for example, as well as uh, the service industry. And these have specific requirements in terms of uh, what kind of competence young people will need to master in order to contribute uh, uh, to societal well-being. Uh, next slide, please. And here what you can see is what kind of skills uh, will people need in order to um, uh, uh, find employment, but also contribute uh, to the pursuing uh, of uh, green objectives. Uh, first of all, there will be skills that will be needed to work alongside people. These are, for example, assisting and caring for others, communicating with persons outside of the organization and taking initiatives. Uh, and these are skills that will be needed uh, because there is an intersection between the green transition and broader um, socioeconomic transformation in society. The second set of skills are skills uh, to work uh, alongside technology. Why? Because a lot of the uh, employment opportunities that will come uh, will arise, particularly in sectors at high levels of technological adoption that will be, uh, in a sense, uh, producing lower CO2 emissions than, for example, manufacturing. And so the ability to develop software, analyzing data and information will be part of uh, the skill package. And finally, there are a set of skills uh, that are needed to work across occupations and industries. These are transversal skills that will become even more important uh, uh, in a greener future, such as making decisions, solving problems, uh, and achievement and effort. Next slide, please. But one thing that we need to remember is that learning environments will need to be adapted themselves uh, in order to meet new environmental conditions. Uh, it's not just about mitigating, but also about adapting. And why is that? 
Well, because increased temperatures will have an impact on the capacity of young people to learn. And here, what you can see is all the different mechanisms responsible for uh, essentially a relationship between extreme temperatures and air pollution, given, for example, wildfires on skill development. Next slide. And with this, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francesco, for your very interesting and important uh, presentation. I think we uh, got a, a, a nice overview of, of, of the requirements that, that young people's resilience is today. It's not only an economic and social and emotional issue, it's also a very ecological issue, and they are very, very well interconnected. So thank you very much. But now we go on uh, to our second presentation. Uh, uh, and we go move towards uh, ray networks findings, uh, monitoring findings, and, and research data. So, Johannes, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Lena. As you all know, one of the priorities of the European youth programs is called environment and fight against climate change. I will talk about the insights from our monitoring service regarding this priority, but uh, as you see, uh, before, we dive, before we dive into the data, let's first have a look at what this priority actually is about. And you see here um, that the Erasmus Plus program, it's a program designed for personal development, and therefore um, it's predominantly focusing the individual participants when it comes to sustainable development. The aim is that participants save resources, reduce waste, and live an overall greener life, or that they enhance career prospects in an emerging green economy. In consequence, Erasmus Plus projects should focus on building necessary knowledge, skills, and attitudes in climate change. The European Solidarity Corps, on the other hand, it's a program made for volunteering, on, made for having an impact on society and doing good. And in line with this, its focus is to promote volunteering and projects that deal with various aspects of climate change, such as protecting natural capital, engage with the effects of natural disasters, and support catastrophe-affected communities. Keep those aims in mind to see how or if they somehow shine through in our survey data. Before we dive into the monitoring insights, though, let's first have a look on our database. The monitoring surveys were modularized. That means that different survey participants always saw a few different modules from the survey and not the whole long thing. Therefore, from 7,500 7, participants in youth projects, around 1,200 responded to the sustainability module. And from 2,900 project team members, 972 saw and responded to the sustainability module. In the Solidarity Corps survey, we have a smaller sample with 260 participants' responses on sustainability and 136 project team member responses. For today, I brought three items. The first one you see already, one around knowledge, one will be around awareness of sustainable development and economic issues, and one will be around behavioral changes. In the domain of knowledge, Young people were asked if in the project they learned something about sustainable development as a social, political, economic, and or sustainable uh, environmental issue. Respectively, project team members were asked if they addressed sustainability in these dimensions. We see that in Erasmus, sustainable development is mostly addressed and learned about as a social and environmental issue, while it is less perceived as a political and economic issue. In volunteering projects in the Solidarity Corps, the pattern remains more or less the same, only that sustainable development as a political and economic issue is both around 10% 10, 10 less addressed and 5% less learned about than in Erasmus Plus projects. Pattern though, same. Regarding awareness, we asked participants to what extent they would agree to the statement that the project has made them more sensitive towards environmental issues. And we asked project team members as well how they think that participants have become more sensible. In Erasmus Plus youth projects, close to 63% of the participants agree or agree strongly that they have become more sensitive. And with 43% agreeing and 31% agreeing strongly, 
close to 75% of the project team members estimate increased sensitivity of participants as well. Only around 10% of the participant, participants deny overall that they have become more aware of environmental issues. For volunteering projects, the pattern is again more or less the same. We too have 10% of participants disagreeing or disagreeing strongly that they've become more sensitive. And we also have close to 63% agreeing or agreeing strongly that they did. Estimation of project team members are also similar, only that instead of 40% agreeing and 30% agreeing strongly, we now have 50% agreeing and 20% agreeing strongly. On behavior, we ask participants if after the project, they are actively contributing to environmental sustainability more less or to the same extent as before the project. We asked them the same question three times. Once for contribution in their everyday life, which you see in stark blue, once in society in light blue, and once in politics in yellow. In Erasmus Plus Youth Projects, a good amount of respondents report a change in behavior. With 43% on a personal level, 38% on a societal level, and significantly lower but still remarkable, 25% on political level. And interestingly, this pattern does not change at all for volunteers in the Solidarity Corps. You see the slide changed, but the numbers didn't. The numbers, they are strikingly similar and the differences are in the area of around 1%. So what conclusions can we draw from this data? We do not, of course, have eligible data for all the program's aims that I introduced at the beginning of my presentation, such as the effects of volunteering projects on national capital or crisis effective communities. We don't have anything on that. But looking at those aspects of the program's aims for which we have data, we can conclude that the European youth programs reach their aims. We identified a significant knowledge increase around sustainable development we identified an increased awareness on ecological issues of participants, and we identified a good amount of youth that indicated behavioral changes on personal, societal, and political level. Interestingly enough, the participants make similar experiences in both programs, and this is regardless of the different formats of Erasmus Plus Youth, which are youth projects, youth exchanges, right? and the Solidarity Corps, which is uh, volunteering projects and primarily individual long-term volunteering. And there's also no difference uh, attributed to the way they address sustainable development, like the aims there are really different, remember? So it's going to be really interesting to discuss the reasons for that. On a more critical level, we have to remark that the political dimension of sustainable development is limping behind the other dimensions. Engaging in policy development and political processes and with decision makers is not explicitly foreseen, neither in the individualizing Erasmus Plus approach, nor in the social engagement approach of the Solidarity Corps. That we do have activities and learning outcomes around the political dimensions of sustainable development might, at least that's my uh, hypothesis, really be attributed to a field of practice, which is just a hat of policy regulations. And last but not least, both programs address young people as agents of change. Through the programs, they should be given opportunity to fight climate change one way or another. And this impulse is empowering and it's laudable. But I would also like to open up the discussion on how we can consider young people as a group that is also crisis affected and that holds, holds rights and not only responsibilities in the climate crisis. And with this thought, I would like to close for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johannes, for your really, really important uh, presentation and, and also uh, that you have involved uh, all, all dimensions uh, of the uh, sustainability in your monitoring. I think it's very, very important and your message is important also to the policy level, not only to the youth work level. And now we go to the to the dialogue, and uh, we start with the uh, topic uh, around green competencies in non-formal and formal uh, learning. Johannes, you uh, mentioned in your presentation uh, that the European youth programs reach pretty much the aims, at least if we don't take take up political and economic uh, levels of sustainability. That means that young people gain individual competencies and knowledge. Uh, green knowledge uh, and are more 
uh, aware of environmental challenges and issues after they have participated in the project. Would you like to elaborate this statement a little bit more and perhaps take your, your, your critical points also a little bit further? Why is it so that the project with their aims but only partially? Hmm. Well, um, I mean, you said it reaches their aims uh, partially uh, on the political and economic level, and I uh, already addressed the political dimension, but let me talk about the economic as well. It's actually kind of uh, curious for me, um, because if we look at the aims of Erasmus+, Plus, we see that it should be about engaging young people in green industry to boost their employability and this actually it aligns with the uh, European Green Deal, right? So um, that we didn't address it that much, um, like the knowledge increase on the economic dimension of sustainable development. It's something that I think can be attributed to maybe the youth work uh, sector as well and how it's structured in, in the non-formal learning, which is a free space or should be a free space not tailored to uh, to increase employability all the time. Um, but thinking about then what Francesca just said um, about the skill set that is relevant for the green transition, um, there are actually a lot of a lot of uh, social skills as well that you mentioned. So um, maybe they do prepare for employability and green transition. And our our research just uh, isn't isn't uh, deficit enough to to show that. Maybe maybe yeah. that one aspect for now. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's very important aspect this 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 economic aspect as well. Uh, Francesca, uh, now you have heard uh, Johannes' presentation on on European youth programs and their sustainability related issues. How would you like to comment on that from, from the point of view of formal learning and, 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 and related research and competencies that, that you have found out there? How would you like to connect these fields? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, one of the things that I particularly uh, liked in terms of uh, the thinking about uh, um, what is missing or what could be done more. Um, I would say the issue of considering young people as being crisis affected uh, and how in particular um, a lot of countries are now starting to think about the adaptation, for example, of uh, school buildings uh, uh, as a way uh, in a sense to protect young people. Of course, uh, uh, in the context of formal education, young people spend the majority of, uh, of their time in school buildings. Uh, and if these are not safe, uh, um, they are too hot, uh, uh, they have poor hair quality, then the current, uh, I would say, environment of young people is affected, but also their opportunity to learn for the future. Another dimension that I wanted to, um, to, to flag is the fact that we often think about uh, uh, young people as individuals and we tailor uh, the skill development uh, programs uh, to the individual youngster, let's say, as a way uh, to make uh, him or her resilient in the present or in the future. But one of the big challenges, I would say, of environmental sustainability is the community dimension. It's the fact of working alongside others. And so one of the big challenges for the formal education sector is to equip young people with the entire toolbox that is needed for environmental sustainability. And that's very much about collaborating with others. On the one hand, pulling different sources of knowledge. Uh, we are dealing with very complex problems that require intersectoral uh, and interdisciplinary approaches to be solved. So different sources of knowledge. But we also have a lot of potential conflict because people who are affected are not necessarily affected to the same degree by the same factors at the same time. And so negotiating conflict uh, is another very important skill that will become important and that we're not focusing enough of because we evaluate uh, individuals, not communities. Uh, and finally, how to organize uh, the different sources of knowledge of different group members. Again, 
that's a very important skill that we are, in a sense, putting aside if we focus on individuals rather than on groups. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more with your statement on, on, on the need for, for more community aspects in the sustainability and, and resili creating resilience for young people. It's, it's really a community matter and it, it, it can be seen also in our humanitarian work throughout the world when we, we will face uh, different kinds of conflicts uh, that are interconnected with climate crisis. Uh, before we go to our uh, next uh, topic or, or dimension of uh, this, this uh, uh, sustainability issue, I have an audience question and perhaps it's more uh, for Francesca. Uh, there is a question about uh, the link to the green competencies framework for sustainability. Uh, if we look at the matter from the European Commission, would you like to say something for that? Perhaps send your Messages yeah. Yes, sure. I mean, the results that I showed you um, were in fact uh, uh, produced uh, in conjunction with researchers from the European Commission's Joint Research Centre, uh, and they mirror the definition of environmental sustainability competence in the Green Comp framework. So they, uh, the idea was to find albeit ex post uh, indicators in the context of large scale assessments uh, like the PISA study that could in a sense map onto the four key dimensions uh, of green comp uh, and on that basis uh, define the full set of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, values, uh, uh, attitudes uh, uh, and skills uh, that make up uh, uh, the, the, green the green comp framework. Thanks, Francesca, and, and please, the audience, uh, I, I encourage you to ask further questions as well. We are we are ready to 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 reply them and a comment from the audience that they really like uh, the idea of, of of focusing on communities instead of individuals, and this leads to to our next uh, dimension or or or, or theme. Uh, I think you both stated somehow as in a in a critical way that. Uh, sustainability related questions which are structural problems and policy problems or often uh, are dealt as individual problems and individual solutions are sought for them uh, and also this this uh, is seen in the educational field both for formal and non-formal and i think this is something which is very very important to to go further on, would you like, Francesca, to, to, to more concrete terms, uh, say what are the significant uh, results where we have somehow uh, succeeded in dealing with this sustainability question also at, as a structural problem and, and where we would like to see the change? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can maybe try to, to go a little bit more, I don't, I don't want to say anecdotal, uh, but it's difficult to have a complete mapping, let's say, uh, of all the range of initiatives uh, that are being taken to, to address this issue. If I think about where I live, I'm currently in Paris, uh, and in the last few years, uh, going back to how the education system is reacting, uh, there has been a complete overhaul in the way in which uh, the school buildings are located within their communities. And so there are the street schools that are now being created, no cars, safe space for children to play, school um, uh, playgrounds are being uh, uh, refurbished in ways that are greener. But this is actually taken as an opportunity to teach young people about, about environmental sustainability. So the trick is actually to embed uh, a participatory, giving young people the agency and the voice uh, to make decisions, uh, to think about uh, what is the problem that we're trying to address, uh, what are some of the different solutions uh, taken into disciplinary approaches. So have, uh, for example, science teachers uh, that discuss ex ante, what would it mean in practice? Uh, uh, why would it be a good idea? Why would it not be a good idea? Let's find out together. And so the opportunity of building civic competences alongside environmental sustainability competences through 
the actual participation of young people is good in three different ways. Uh, one is that uh, it actually gives people agency and long term the um, feeling that they can make a difference uh, through the action. Second, uh, it actually sticks for longer. It's not uh, a you know top down uh, kind of the teacher tells me and then I memorize something that I forget tomorrow. It's actually uh, a learning process uh, and it actually strengthens, and that's the third part, uh, other sorts of uh, skills and competences. And so it's not seen also by school personnel as taking away time from the, let's say, more traditional academic subjects because uh, the, the curriculum is already quite full. So it's a win-win in different dimensions. Uh, Thank you, Francesca. Very important three-dimensional <laughs> reply from you. Uh, Johannes, if you would like to, to reflect on a little bit further on, uh, on this critical point that structural problems are, are existent, but we search for, for individual solutions for them, and this is also seen in the European youth programs, at least somewhat. Uh, how would you like to develop or change the pro program framework so that it could take into account also the structural level of, of sustainability when, when, when well first of all I would like to say that it's becoming even more ridiculous to individualize um, the climate crisis when on the other hand we have those exceptional pedagogical approaches that you just exemplified Francesca um, because it has a problem let me talk about that problem one for one minute uh, even more. If we aim for young people to live a greener life or to develop competencies on their own to, I don't know, engage in green industry or something, then we individualize the climate crisis and neglect its structural dimension. Okay. But it also, like, it suggests an seemingly easy, easy solution to uh, stop global warming. And this easy solution is dangerous because it's oversimplifying. But it's also uh, dangerous because it's uh, imposing the responsibility for the climate crisis on young people's shoulder because if the solution to stop global warming lies in your own behavior, well, then uh, the cause must lie there as well, right? Um, and climate anxiety is something that young people are already threatened with. And we really should be careful not to, uh, not to further this issue. Um, SOC, the Solidarity Corps, is partially going a different way. It's identifying courses and it's tackling problems, not on a personal, but on a community and societal level. But it's still putting young people in the driver's seat. Um, what SOC does, though, is it uh, also is not only about mitigating uh, carbon emissions, right? It's also about adapting to new realities, something that you also mentioned, Francesca. And I would love to see that Erasmus Plus is including these dimensions as well, further. And um, I'm actually not too pessimistic that the field of practice is doing that already. Um, we would need a more qualitative approach to see that. But um, if we look at the way that uh, sustainable development is addressed by project team members, then we see that 70% at address it as a social issue. Uh, so youth workers are actually indicate, like you see that they might have a, a widespread expertise within the youth work community on that, on that level. And that is despite the fact that the training sector on sustainable youth work is only now kicking off. We don't have too much yet. So there is opportunity there. And with the South of Green that's recently founded, I have my hopes up that we can really uh, strengthen our game there. Thank you very much. I, I, I think that we really need more intergenerational dialogue also in order to, you know, create a more sustainable and shared understanding of the topic itself. It seems that, that we live, live also in, in our generational bubbles, perhaps a little bit. And at that, kind of, that kind of dialogue across generations is also needed. Now I take one question from the audience. Uh, the, 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 person is curious about mainstreaming and uh, about the policy level, how to include young people more in policy making. I think this 
continues nicely what you were stating and uh, what it might what that might affect statistics in different countries well at least this policy question what would you like to see in the future if we think about this question of of, of having policy more involved and young people more involved in env environmental policy as well maybe i can uh, uh start off uh, um one of the so i'm um, the oecd is an organization that is responsible for the compilation of uh, um, cross-country comparable statistics uh, and in particular when we think about young people we started off uh, back in 2000 with the program for international student assessment uh, that was very much uh, uh, an education instrument uh, uh, to look at uh, the skills and competences uh, of young people in different countries. Uh, now, over the years, uh, it has become much more, maybe it's not perfect, uh, but it has become much more an instrument also to hear the voice of young people. And this, in a sense, uh, affects policymaking because uh, the indicators and statistics uh, uh, that are generated from, from the study uh, feed into the policy discussions on what do we want, uh, what do we consider to be in a successful education system. So just to give you an example, in the uh, last few rounds, uh, we've had the studies implemented every three years. And in the last few rounds, we have uh, questions about, for example, anxiety. We have questions about well-being. We have questions uh, about the aspirations uh, of young people, uh, what, what worries them, uh, whether they are being bullied, and etc. These are just examples, but they tell, they, they allow young people to have a voice. Of course, it's mediated, so to speak, but it's a way um, to actually affect the official statistics upon which uh, education policymaking uh, is being developed. So that's the context in which I operate personally. Uh, but I would say that in the past 22 years, uh, there has been an incredible shift uh, in the opportunity for young people to have their voices being heard uh, through the, uh, the, the, the instruments that we develop. And I, I would like to add something as well. Um, I mean, of course, we would need the structures and opportunities for young people to get them involved in policy development processes. But we would also need to enable young people to be able to do so. And in um, the, the discourse on education for sustainable development, there is one competence that is frequently highlighted. And this is something called shaping competence. And shaping competence is understood as something like a bundle of knowledge, analytical lenses, and skills to proactively engage in sustainable action at your own will. So it really requires an openness to enable young people to shape the matters they want in the way they want to. And um, the programs, like if we look at the European youth programs, we see that they have actually pretty specific goals with young people so far to engage them in projects that uh, adapt to changing climate realities or uh, to, to engage in crisis-affected communities or to live a greener life. But it's not really an open-aimed process. So we might need to work on that a little bit as well to give young people the skills to actually engage in policy making as well in this area of uh yeah of sustainable development because in the european youth programs we do see that already we have our own priority on democracy and participation so we know how to do that uh let's make it happen for sustainability as well thank you for your quite promising uh statements i i think it's very important to to, to talk about the power and recognition and even representation of different generations and young generation in in front of this climate crisis and if we think about a couple of years back and we had quite active children and and, and youth movements uh, uh throughout the world where young people were concerned about climate crisis and said that well adults you must do something i think that we had to, uh, sadly critical comments toward young people stating that you are too young to take your 
floor and, and you must go to school instead of be in the street, etc. So I, I really think that this is this is something which needs to be improved that that, that the generations uh, can can somehow collaborate and and, and recognition of, of, of new kinds of civic civic action is taken into account also when, when climate crisis is is, is discussed and, and and hopefully also some kind of tackles uh, are are found. But now I think we have the time unfortunately to go to our final question and 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 this is also a personal question. Uh, our last dialogue uh, dealt with uh, social inclusion and uh, if we understand uh, sustainability intersectionally as you have you have uh, stated social inclusion is also an important element of sustainability therefore it seems appropriate to to end this dialogue in the same way as the previous dialogue and with the same question if it were up to you, what would be the message related to the youth and sustainability related issues that you would particularly like European decision makers to hear on the basis of your research findings? Very short uh, messages to, to the power of Europe. Um, I can go first, maybe. I mean, understanding sustainability intersectionally means to understand that the climate crisis affects nobody in the same way. And that marginalized groups of people are affected most heavily by the effects of extreme weather and global warming in general. Any kind of learning mobility has the huge potential to firsthand experience what the climate crisis means for people living in different places and under different conditions and to learn from each other about how to take action. Our data actually underscores the huge impact of the European youth programs on personal development and sustainability matters. And if I had a message, I would love to let decision makers just hear this and further support and strengthen the programs. Thank you, Johannes. And Francesca. Yeah, I'll uh, try to be even briefer. Um, <laughs> I would say considering, uh, I mean, I think it's very important for policymakers to consider to consider putting the most effort uh, where the biggest need is, uh, rather than where it's easiest uh, to put it, uh, because that's that's the tendency we have, and with such a, a a big scale problem, that's really part of of the solution. And just by ending with a quote by Roberto Mangabera Unger, who says. Society is made and imagined. Uh, it is a human artifact rather than the expression of an underlying natural order. And one of the things that young people have is, you know, the um, daring of thinking things differently. And that's precisely what we need at this time. It's not because we've done it in this way for the past, uh, I don't know how many decades, that it's the only way possible. So daring to think outside of this box, uh, it's important. Uh, and uh, as I say, it's made and imagined that it's not fixed and can be changed. Thank you so much for your words. Uh, I think uh, that concluded our debate in a very nice way, uh, connecting policy and ethics together because climate question and sustainability question is also it, that's also an ethical issue and moral issue thank you so much francesca and johannes for your very valuable inputs and discussion will will certainly go further and unfortunately we couldn't take uh, every every audience question but they will be uh, answered in our facebook site so thank you so much and now to carmen <laughs>
Yeah, I have some last words and I hope you understand me because my wireless is a bit lacking. I just wanted to say that our next Youth Research Dialogue will be in autumn, but you will hear from us beforehand. We have some events coming up where we will live stream some panel discussions. So please check out our website and social media channels for any updates. And I also want to um, yeah, tell you about our Ray Triangular Summit. So this is a uh, dissemination and communication event we host in May, and it's basically what we have discussed in the last five youth research dialogue when we presented uh, first insights from the RAIN monitoring service. It's basically the, the big dissemination event for our findings. And yeah, we have uh, stakeholders from policy practice and research there and want to discuss what this evidence-based research actually means for different fields and different stakeholders. Yeah, and if you cannot be there, no worry, uh, we will um, yeah share the outcomes with you, of course, and also as last word, um, the report, the transnational uh, research reports for the monitoring service, they are currently written by our research team and they will be published also before the summer break on our website. So, um, yeah, stay tuned and yeah, hope to see you soon and take care. <laughs>